Let's turn now in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. John said, There was given to me a reed like unto a rod. Now, a rod was a measuring stick. It was about five, it was about uh, nine feet long. Uh, a rod was six cubits. A cubit is about 17 to 18 inches. The cubit is the distance between your elbow and your middle finger, about 17, 18 inches, and six of those made up a rod. And so they would take these uh, bamboo sticks that were straight, and they would cut them at uh, the six cubits, which made the measuring rods nine feet. And they were used much like our uh, measuring uh, tapes today, uh, but they were just the sticks and they would lay them out. The rod or the span was the uh, distance between your thumb and little finger. The cubit uh, was, they didn't have the Stanley uh, rulers in those days and so uh, they made do with what they had. So John was given this reed that was like a rod and he, the angel, stood and said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those that worship therein. Now, the temple is to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. In the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, where he prophesied that from the time the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, would be 69 weeks of years or 483 years. But the angel had told Daniel there were 77s that were determined upon the nation of Israel. 69 of them fulfilled from the time the commandment went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. There is one seven-year period that was not fulfilled. It is yet future. Jesus made mention of this in the prophecies concerning his return, Matthew 24. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then flee to the wilderness. Now he was talking to the disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age. So it is still yet future, the 70th week of Daniel. There's been an interval of time between the end of the 69 week, and, and he would said the, the Messiah would be cut off, the people would be dispersed, and that's exactly what happened. Jesus was cut off, did not receive the kingdom. The people were dispersed. And so we have now a time gap which is known as the time of the Gentiles. It is the time in which God has opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. And the main thrust of the Spirit is among the Gentile nations today. But the times of the Gentiles are about fulfilled. God has a seven-year covenant yet to complete with the nation of Israel. And so there in the end of Daniel chapter 9, he talks about the prince of the people that shall come, the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin. He will make a covenant with the nation of Israel for the one week or the seven year period. But in the midst of that week, he will break the covenant and he will come to the temple that has been built. He will stand in the Holy of Holies and he will proclaim that he is God and he will demand that they worship him as God. That will be in the middle of the final seven-year period. 
Now, this man of sin cannot be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. So looking at the sequence of events, when the Lord raptures the church, which is the hindering force that is keeping him from taking over the world right now, when the church is removed, then this man of sin comes on the scene. He will rise up out of the European community and he will begin to gain power over the whole earth. He will be a man of uh, just phenomenal as far as the powers that he is able to demonstrate because he demonstrates all of the powers of darkness. And during his time, there will be, of course, at the beginning, a great period of prosperity. He will be able to bring solutions to problems that seem to be insolvable. The problem of the nation of Israel existence with the Arab neighbors, the Muslims. The problem of uh, the desire of the Jews to rebuild their temple but the fact that the Muslims have declared the Temple Mount a holy site to the Muslims and have built the Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock uh, monuments there on the Temple Mount. But the man of sin, the Antichrist, will make a covenant with the nation of Israel. No doubt in that covenant he will bring the solution to uh, the problem of the Jews rebuilding their temple. They would not think of rebuilding their temple anywhere but the Temple Mount. How can that problem be resolved? Well, interestingly enough, though it seems totally impossible today, yet the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen. And he will make the covenant with the nation of Israel. No doubt, according to Ezekiel chapter 42, verse 20, he speaks of the wall that is built. Uh, and it is to separate, it says, the holy place from the profane. So I would envision that he will offer the solution that just north of the Dome of the Rock Mosque, they put up a wall of separation that will separate the southern portion of the, Do of the uh, Temple Mount area and will give the Jews the northern area of the Temple Mount area to build their temple. Actually, the Muslim Dome of the Rock is about the middle of the Temple Mount, and of course the Al-Aqsa is on the southern end of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Temple Mount area. It leaves a large area, probably 12 acres or so, north of the Dome of the Rock Mount, plenty of room to rebuild the temple, on which many scholars believe is the original temple site. It is, there is right now on that northern portion a little cupola which is called the Dome of the Spirits, also known as the Dome of the Tablets. It's built over a flat bedrock area and there are Many who believe that that is where the Holy of Holies existed in the Temple of Solomon, I mean the Temple of Solomon and also the temple that was rebuilt uh, by the Jews and of course completed by Herod, the great temple that Herod built. It is directly in from the east gate of the old wall and thus it lines up with where the temple once stood. That is in the area that is north. It's about 322 feet north of the Dome of the Rock Mosque so that they could rebuild their temple there. The only thing, there would not be room for the outer court. Now, 
you actually had the outer court of the temple where the Gentiles could come. It was known as the court of the Gentiles. Within that was the court of the women. The Gentiles were not allowed to go beyond the court of the Gentiles. There was a uh, balustrade and, and into the next court only uh, the Jews could come. It was called the court of the women. Within that was the court of the men and the women could not come into that. And within that was uh, the holy place where only the priests could go. And of course, within the holy place was the holy of holies where only the high priest could go. So in the rebuilding of the temple on this site, the Dome of the Rock would stand in what would be the outer court. And so it is interesting that when John is given this rod to measure the temple, he is commanded the court which is without, or the outer court of the temple, leave out. Don't measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles and the holy city they shall tread underfoot for 42 months. Interesting that the Lord tells John, don't measure the outer court. And in Ezekiel, he speaks of the wall to separate the holy place from the profane. John said, and I will, and the Lord said, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. The prophecies in the Bible are predicated on the Babylonian calendar, which was a three hundred and sixty day calendar, it's three hundred and sixty day year calendar. And the prophecies are in accord with the Babylonian calendar, so three and a half years would be 1,260 days on the Babylonian calendar. These two witnesses prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, the time that the uh, Jerusalem is given over to the Gentiles. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now this takes you back to the book of Zechariah. When the Jews came back to rebuild the temple, two of the leaders were Zechariah and Joshua the priest. And they were leading the people in the rebuilding of the temple. And there was great discouragement because the walls of the city were still in rubble and as they would build at night, the enemies would come in and tear down what they were building. It was a very demoralizing experience. And the rubble was so great uh, of the Temple of Solomon, which was a huge edifice. But the rubble, when the Babylonians destroyed it was such a huge pile of rubble that with the, the people that they had, it just seemed like it was a mountain of rubble and they would never be able to put the temple together again. And so there was the dream that Zechariah had. And it was a dream of uh, a sort of a contraption where there was the, the candles uh, with the cups that were daily filled with oil by the priest in order that there might be light within the uh, holy place. And he saw these olive trees and pipes were coming out of the olive trees and filling the cups automatically with oil directly from the olive trees. So it was sort of an interesting looking kind of a contraption. And the Lord said, what are these? Zechariah didn't know. And he said, uh, this is the word of the Lord to Zechariah. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. This 
mountain shall be moved, the mountain of rubble. The temple will be built, but not by the might or power of man, but by the help of the Spirit of God. And so these are the two witnesses that stood before the earth. It is a reference to uh, Zechariah and to uh, Joshua. These are the two olive trees, he said. So that takes you back to that. But who are the two witnesses? Now, back in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, in fact, just about the last word of God before the 400 years of silence, the Lord said in the very end of the Old Testament, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the promise that Elijah would return before the great day of the Lord. Now, the Jews today, even to the present time, when they observe the Passover, always set an extra place at the table, and it is for Elijah. They keep the door open, and they are hoping that this will be the year that Elijah comes to prepare the way for the Messiah. Elijah will no doubt be one of the two witnesses. Now, when John the Baptist came as the forerunner of Jesus, the angel who announced to his father Zacharias that he was to have a son told Zacharias that he would go in the spirit and in the power of Elijah turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. When John the Baptist began his ministry, they asked him, who are you? Are you the Messiah? John said, no. They said, are you Elijah? And John said, no. They said, who are you then? And he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare ye the ways of the Lord, make straight his paths. In other words, I'm preparing for the king to come. Later on, Jesus said to his disciples after the martyrdom or the death of, uh, of uh, John the Baptist by Herod, Jesus said, of all of the men born of women, there has not been a greater than John the Baptist. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The privileges that we have as, as the church, greater than any of the privileges that the Old Testament saints enjoyed. The disciples said, how is it then that the scriptures say that Elijah must first come? because he was considered one of the greats of the Old Testament. And Jesus said, Elijah shall first come. In other words, John the Baptist was already dead, but he predicted that Elijah would first come. But if you're able to receive it, this was Elijah, if you're able to grasp this. But he affirmed that Elijah would again first come before he would come back again. So surely one of the two witnesses is Elijah. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. They were similar in character. They were rugged men. They were rough men. They were a man's man. Uh, a man of, of the, you know, outdoors, just really a man's man, tough, rugged, similar in nature, similar in spirit. They didn't mince words. 
They told it straight. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power when they said, are you Elijah? And he answered, no. He was actually declaring, I'm not the fulfillment of Malachi 4. That is future. But I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord. So, in a sense, he was. In a sense, he wasn't. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you're able to receive this, uh, this was John, this was Elijah, of whom the prophet spoke. But it wasn't the complete fulfillment. That remains to when Elijah returns with another witness. But who is the other witness? I think if the Lord wanted us to know, he would have told us. But there has been a lot of speculation, and it is interesting to speculate as to who the other might be. A lot of people believe it will be Enoch for the reason that Enoch did not die, and the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And Enoch indeed was a prophet, a prophet. Jude quotes from the prophecy of Enoch concerning the Lord's coming. And so Enoch makes a great candidate. Elijah and Enoch were two men of the Old Testament that did not die natural deaths. And thus, uh, he makes a good candidate. However, by this time, the church will have been raptured, and thus, as Paul said, I'll tell you a mystery, not all are going to die, but we're all going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. So uh, it doesn't make Enoch exclusive in not dying because the whole church will have been raptured by this time. Others have surmised that it will be Moses, because it was Moses that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it seems like they're sort of buddies. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thus, uh, many look at Moses as a possible second witness. That would be very interesting because in the Old Testament, it's really divided between the law and the prophets. And when you think of the law, you think of Moses. And in the minds of the Jews, he is representative of God's word to man. And thus, Moses makes a very likely candidate uh, because you would have the law and the prophets who are coming. Elijah sort of is the head of the prophets, Moses the head of the law. And so you have the great lawgiver and you have uh, Elijah, the head of the prophets, and, and they would make a great combination to the Jew as the representatives of the law and the prophets. Jesus, when he showed himself to be the Messiah and how he'd have to suffer, he went through the law and he went through the prophets showing them all of the scriptures that referred to the suffering and the death of the Messiah. So, uh, it would be great representatives, the representative of the law, the representative of the prophets coming to the people in these last days prior to the return of the Messiah. There is a, another feature with Moses in that uh, he, they, the two witnesses bring the plagues upon the people. And of course, it was through Moses that the plagues were brought upon the Egyptians. There are others who believe that it is John the Baptist. Uh, as I said, these two guys were so similar in character, they would make a powerful, dynamic duo. You get the two together, and that would be dynamite. So there are those who believe that it could be John the Baptist. Others who believe that it could be uh, Zechariah, uh, because of the 
uh, statement that these are the two witnesses that stand before the Lord, before the whole earth. And going back to the book of Zechariah, while others believe that it will be John the Beloved, the writer of the book of Revelation, because in the last verse of chapter 10, the Lord said to John, you must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. So those are the various people who are suggested. But again, if God wanted us, wanted us to know for certain, he would have told us. So you can take your pick. And uh, we really don't know. Now, we are told, though, concerning their ministry. If any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, this takes you back to Elijah. When the king had ordered a captain with a hundred men to go and bring Elijah as a captive. When the man came to Elijah where he was sitting there in the hillside, he said, Oh, thou man of God, the king has sent me here to arrest you. He said, If I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven and consume you and your men. And fire came from heaven and consumed him with his men. So the king sent out another captain with a hundred and he said, oh, man of God, the king has ordered me to rest you. I'm man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you. And it did. The third fellow was sent out to bring him in. And he said, have mercy upon me. I'm a, uh, I have a wife and children and they need me and all. But, you know, I've been dispatched by the, would you mind please, you know. And, and Elijah went with him. But uh, the calling down fire to consume the enemy. And so you have this identity with Elijah and his ministry in the Old Testament. They also have power to shut up the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, which is three and a half years, 1,260 days. You remember that when Elijah was ministering and uh, he said, let it not rain again until I say it. And God shut up the heavens during the time that Elijah was prophesying so that there came a tremendous drought during that time. And James tells us that Elijah was a man of like passions like we are, yet he prayed and it rained not for the space of three years and he prayed again and it did rain. So surely the finger points to Elijah as one of the two the power to shut up heavens that it rains not. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. One of the plagues of Egypt was the waters were turned to blood, uh, the Nile River and all, and it began to smell. And so they have power as Moses with the plagues. And so that is one of the reasons why some people do believe that Moses is the other witness. And then we have an interesting statement. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit, that is the Antichrist, will make war against them and will overcome them and kill them. So when they have finished their testimony, but notice, until they have finished their testimony, they're indestructible. God preserves them. I believe that God has a purpose for each of our lives. And I believe as we are pursuing that purpose of God for our lives, that God is going to watch over, protect, and keep us until we have completed God's purposes for our lives. And once we have completed God's purposes for our lives, I believe the Lord is going to take us home. Why would he want to leave us here on this rotten earth? 
any longer than necessary to fulfill the purposes that he has for us. It's interesting to me that until they had finished their witness, they were indestructible. But once their ministry was complete, then God gave power to the Antichrist, to the beast, who ascends out of the abuso. We'll get to that when we get to the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, how that the, the beast comes out of the abuso. And he goes into Gehenna, but that, that we'll wait for further time on that one. So he makes war against them and overcomes them and kills them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom. That's a reference to uh, Jerusalem in the Old Testament by one of the prophets and Egypt, the place of the flesh, and to identify it fully as Jerusalem, where also our Lord was crucified. So the Antichrist kills them, and their bodies lie in the streets of Jerusalem. And they of the people and the families and tongues and the nations shall see their dead bodies for three days and a half, and they will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. Interesting, isn't it? The world will see their bodies lying there in the streets of Jerusalem. Tell me, how could that be possible prior to satellite television? You see, this passage could not have been fulfilled 50 years ago. Two men lying dead in the streets of Jerusalem and the whole world looking at them. Dan Rather and <laughs> CBS and ABC and NBC there with their cameras and, of course, Ted Turner with his CNN. And there they are showing their bodies on television. And around the world, people see the bodies lying there. It will be quite a show, quite a spectacle. Now, in Israel, when a person dies, they bury them the same day that they die. It's just a tradition and custom. They don't embalm the bodies but they immediately bury them when they die. The same day that, they're, that they die, they are buried. Not so these two. They leave the bodies just lying there as the whole world looks on. And they of the people and the families and Tongues and nations will see the dead bodies for three and a half days, will not allow them to be buried or put into graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them. You see, the earth has been suffering. They have shut up heaven that it did not rain. They have brought plagues upon the earth. They've turned the water to blood. And thus... These men will be public enemies, number one. And when they see their bodies lying there dead, they're going to just rejoice and it's going to be party time. It'll be like a Christmas celebration or the Mardi Gras. For they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and will make merry, big parties. They will send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. But after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God enters into them, and they stand on their feet, and great fear falls upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, 
and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. I'm sure that they'll be saying, cut the cameras, cut the cameras. <laughs> they won't want the world to see this. The news is always trying to just hide a lot of truth from you. They show you only parts of the story. But the media today is designed to frame opinions and to control people by, the, by distorting the news and only telling you a part of the story in order to cause you to be upset and to have a certain opinion on particular things. And so there is this spin by the media uh, and the controlling of the news and only telling you what they want you to hear to cause you to get strong opinions on different subjects. And thus, though they'll be too late, the, the world will watch as their bodies ascend up into a cloud and God receives them into heaven. The voice saying, come up hither, that's the same words that were said to John back in chapter 4 when he was taken into the heavenly scene. Now in the same hour as they're taken into heaven, there's a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city of Jerusalem falls. And in the earthquake there were slain 7,000 of men and the remnant were frightened and they gave glory to the God of heaven, and the second woe is past. Now, remember, there were three woes that were to come. This is the end of the second woe, or of the sixth trumpet. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, the seventh angel sounded. Now, during the time of this seventh angel will be the third woe. But it's woe to the inhabitants of the earth who have rebelled against the authority of God. And within the seventh trumpet will bring the final culmination of the rule of man. And it will bring the establishing of the kingdom of God, which will be a definite woe to the men and women who are not a part of that kingdom. They are to be cut off, and thus a great woe when Jesus returns. Now some have made the mistake of identifying this seventh trumpet with the trump of God that signals the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and also the last trump in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where we will all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. But the trumpets are, this is the second coming, this is not the rapture of the church, but this signals the second coming of Jesus and the establishing of God's kingdom upon the earth. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That takes you on through. That's just a, it's taking you on out to uh, the glorious time when Jesus returns to establish the kingdom. There are still other events that will transpire between this and the 19th chapter when he comes to claim that which he purchased by his death upon the cross. But this is now covering in the sounding of the days, it said, of the seventh trumpet. So it takes, period, takes place over a period of time. And he shall reign forever and ever. 
and the 24 elders which sat before God on their thrones fell upon their faces and they worshiped God saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which wast, and art to come, because you have taken to thee thy great power and have reigned. Jesus came to redeem the world back to God. The world originally belonged to God. He created it. When God created man and placed him on the earth, he gave the earth to man. Have dominion over the earth, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. Adam, in turn, forfeited the earth over to Satan. So that at the present time, Satan is the ruler over the earth. Notice it isn't the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom. This is Satan's kingdom now. It was forfeited to Satan by Adam. But Jesus came to redeem the earth back to God. That was the purpose of his coming. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. He spoke about how that the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man going through a field and discovering a treasure and who for the joy thereof sells everything in order to buy the field so he can have the treasure. In the parables, Jesus said, now the field is the world and the church has been called his peculiar treasure. Who is it that gave everything to buy the world? Jesus gave his life to redeem the world from the power of sin and the power of darkness in order that he might take the treasure that is you, his church, out of this world. When Jesus came after his baptism at the beginning of his ministry, Satan came to him after his 40-day fast in the wilderness and he suggested that he use now his divine powers to satisfy his own lust or desire for food. He was hungry after 40 days of fasting. Turn this stone into bread, Satan suggested. And Jesus responded, it is written that man doesn't live by bread alone. Then Satan took him up to a high mountain and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And Satan boasted to Jesus, all of these are mine. I can give them to whomever I will and I'll give them to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, Jesus had come to redeem the world back to God, but the price of redemption was his blood. We are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from the empty lives we once lived, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was slain as a lamb without spot and blemish. Satan is basically suggesting the cross is not necessary. God's path is not necessary. We can shortcut. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. I'll give you the kingdoms now. Jesus answered and said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. But Satan bragging that the kingdom was his. Jesus acknowledged it. He called him the prince of this world. Paul calls him the God of this world. But in the seventh trump, the, the kingdom, not plural, kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah or his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. And in response, the elders on these 24 on these thrones fall and they worship God, giving thanks, 
saying, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and which art to come, because you have taken to thee thy great power in his reign. The time has come for him to claim his purchased possession. He purchased the world almost 2,000 years ago, and yet he hasn't yet laid claim. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us concerning Jesus that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. As God, he could not die. So he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. In other words, he took upon himself the human nature. He did remain God, but took on the human nature that that side might die for the suffering of death. But we see him crowned with glory and honor. And God has put all things in subjection unto him. But the writer went on to say, we do not yet see all things in subjection to him. Satan is still the ruler of this dark world in which we live. But this is the time when Jesus comes to claim that which he purchased. The nations, it says, were angry. And your wrath is come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that you should give reward to the, your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Turn back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. And Matthew speaks of when Jesus comes again. Jesus is actually speaking. Matthew is telling us uh, what Jesus said. In verse 31... When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. We have it here in Revelation chapter 11. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all of the nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. And then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you and thirsty and gave you to drink and saw you as a stranger and took you in or naked and we clothed you? And when, we, and when saw we you sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. And then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick, and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you? And then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Two destinies, life eternal or everlasting punishment. You are in one of the two crowds. Now, they are declaring the day of your judgment has come. That they should be judged and that you should give a reward to your servants 
the prophets, and to the saints, and to those that fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy them which destroy the earth. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, one of the names of Satan is destroyer. He has destroyed the earth. He is destroying lives. As you look at the world today, you see how many people's lives are being destroyed by sin. Satan is the destroyer. You see how man is destroying the earth. But it's not going to be saved by Gore or the other tree huggers. <laughs> the Lord's going to step in and save things. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. Now, you remember the earthly temple was a model. God gave the design, the dimensions to Moses, and God instructed him to be sure that you make it exactly as you were instructed. For we are told in the book of Hebrews that these things are all a model of the heavenly, the throne of God in heaven. Uh, the earthly tabernacle was a model of that. So there is the temple in heaven. John sees it open. And there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Covenant. Now this is not the Ark of the Covenant that was the model that Moses had made and put in the tabernacle and was later placed in the temple built by Solomon. Where that Ark is, we don't know. There are Jews that say they know where it is and that at the proper time they'll bring it forth when they rebuild their temple. The phalange, not the phalange, yes, the phalanges in, in Ethiopia claim that they have the Ark of the Covenant there, that Jeremiah brought it to them uh, before Nebuchadnezzar came back to destroy the temple. It never was put in the rebuilt temple uh, by uh, the uh, Ezra and, and the building of the temple there, nor was it in the temple that was built by Herod the Great. But the true Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. He saw the Ark of the Covenant, and there were lightnings, voices, thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. So we still have these aspects of judgment. He's taking you sort of a brief kind of a overview of the whole thing, and now we're going to come back and we're going to be filling in some details as we begin with chapter 12. This is going to be sort of amplifying some of the territory that we have covered, and this will be so on through uh, to chapter 20. Uh, we'll be sort of going back and amplifying some of the things uh, that have to do with the seventh trumpet and the return of the Lord and his reigning over the kingdom forever and ever. So next week... Chapter 12, fascinating chapter as we deal with events that will be taking place in the last half of the three and a half years uh, of the Great Tribulation period. Father, again, we're so grateful for the insight that you have given to us, that you have not left us, Lord, without a plan, without a map, and you have mapped out for us what the future holds. And Lord, we realize that we are all headed into these last days. The scene has been set. All of the props are in place. We wait, Lord for you to come and to take us home, to be with you in the kingdom of heaven, that you might begin the final seven-year period upon the earth 
as you cleanse it and purge it for the return of our Lord. Father, we realize that our destinies are either with you in the kingdom of light or with Satan in the kingdom of darkness. And that you have given to us the invitation to come and to receive life. Lord, may we respond to that invitation in Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Pastors are down here in the front to pray with you tonight. Whatever your need might be, they're here for the purpose of bearing your burden with you and praying for you. So as soon as we're dismissed, if you want to come forward, they'll be more than happy to spend time with you in prayer, fulfilling the scriptures that say, pray ye one for another, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. They're here to help bear your burden tonight. All you have to do is come forward, and they're here to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That last phrase again, let's do it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And now, on behalf of The Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact The Word for Today at The Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.